Uh, welcome to this episode. In this episode, I've got Dave Thorpe with me, who's going to talk to us about digital and what he's done in his past and his role to get to where he is today. And um, very welcome to have you. So first of all, thank you and for joining me and welcome, Dave. Hi, Steve, and good morning, everyone from a rather sunny Scotland here as we head into sunny autumn. Scotland. Thank you. And uh, I'm surprised it's sunny. That's good. And I think it is here in Norfolk. Yep, it is. So we're sunny everywhere. So thank, thanks for taking the time. And um, well, as as we already had a quick little chat, obviously the, the our main core audience is hopefully people that are new to this sector of digital data uh, and all the rest of it. And we'll talk about themes, particularly if I can. I wouldn't normally guide the conversation too much, but uh, obviously your role in uh, regarding impact that will be something we'll get to later. But that's really important for me because that's a big part of what I do. So if if you would, uh, if people don't know who you are, if you could just introduce yourself and just briefly your background and how you got to where you are today that's really important for the audience to know that people have different um, sort of starting points to get to where we are so over to you Dave. Yeah th thanks Steve yeah, yeah it's interesting I didn't actually intend to come into construction I thought I was gonna be a photographer for, you know when I left school that was that was my, my course of action and, and my dad's an electrical design engineer I remember my dad I must have been about 16 years old saying you know you know what dad I'm thinking about changing career I think we're going to construction and remember my dad sort of just sitting at the dinner table as the peas fell off his fork. He went, no, it's not for you. And I went, okay. And he said to me, I tell you what, if you get yourself a summer job and see how you go. So my first job in construction was up at Faslane, uh, which is a nuclear submarine base up on the Clyde uh, with there, where I was going to be sort of a bit of a gopher, you know, in terms of, if you like, you know, be able to, to help pull cables and everything and uh, you're thinking you know Dave you'd be good at that with your obvious strength but uh, b believe it or not I wasn't and uh, but what happened and this is probably even from the very beginnings of things my first foray into digital because uh, I was really lucky up there there was a, a project director who took a lot of interest in terms of you know me and you know I was just leaving school and everything and he said I'll tell you what you do at school and I was talking about back then I had this really powerful uh, computer uh, called a ZX Spectrum, which uh, with the RAM pack is something like 120 k. But I was talking about you know things we're doing at school, and I was doing this exciting thing called CAD, this computer you know AD design sort of thing. And remember, if you went back then, you know, that's when drawing boards were in offices. You know, folk were sitting, they had amazing drawings. And I said, oh, why are you not using CAD? He said, oh, I've never heard of it. And I ended up as a student actually doing CAD up at Faz Lane within there. And it was interesting because I didn't know what I was drawing. You know, it was, it was actually, if you think about where we're going now, it was actually scatter type, you know, schematic. Some would give me something, you know, a rough sketch there. But, you know, it showed that, you know, there was real value in terms of doing digital uh, within there. And then uh, for me, it was then going on to construction management. I'd done my, I'd done an HND, I took the long road. Uh, I'd done an HND in construction management first, which was actually hugely important because I think, we often think about straight to university and knowledge, but especially from a surveying point of view, it taught me all the skills that I needed as well within there. You know, the real basics in terms of measured survey and, you know, setting out, uh, you know, within there. So I had an HND in construction management, and then I went on and done my degree in building engineering and management. And I was lucky at that point to get, uh, you know, Balfour Beatty sponsored me through the rest of my career. And I started off as a, you know, a setting out engineer. And boy, did I find out the importance of information at that point as well, especially setting out, you know, having, having the latest drawings. You think of all the data and everything you collected, it was in your yellow, you know, your dimension book within there. And yeah, I mean, I remember setting out things wrongly because I didn't have the latest information within there. You know, collaboration was, was, was difficult and actually, I think back within there, the big challenge was this thing called email had kind of came out. Folk were scatter emails within there. And actually, when I look back to prior to that, you know, being up at Faz Lane, I, I remember the guy who was office manager, he was called the Bombardier, you know, XRAF. And gosh, did he manage information? You know, it was big ledger books within there, but very good at it. You know, imagine one of the first things I had to do when I started there was learn the art of folding a drawing, you know, an A0, an A1 drawing within there to make sure the information, the title block was legible with there, but everything was recorded so accurately. And then when email came in, it just became scatterfire, you know, no one was recording 
you know, as well as the sheer of information transmittals, did everybody have the, the latest information? Was information accurate, uh, you know, within there? You, you start to see uh, within there as well. So I spent my first couple of years, you know, on site, you know, setting out. And you kind of hope that you, your career would that been from, you know, sort of young engineer, you know, section engineer, you know, project manager, project director. Yeah, that was kind of the way the career kind of your ladder was set out. And I was kind of going, that was I the best set out engineer? I very much doubt it within there. But what happened uh, what one day is I got a call from our, our head office, said, hey, we bought this planning software and we know you can work a computer. Would you come in and uh, have a look at it with us? And remember, that was back in the days, again, where folk were generally on drawing boards doing network analysis. And I came back and it was, you know, what you see, what you get is a sort of, you know, Gantt chart type one within there. And I kind of remembered from university days that, OK, you know, if you it was a building sort of thing. If, you know, I remembered the, the sort of power on, wind and weather type. And you knew if it was kind of 45 degrees, it looked kind of right. And you thought, there's nothing you can really do if you fling enough resource into it in eight and ten weeks, uh, you know, within there as well. And I remember, and it probably wasn't a, the best program, but people saw this and thought, wow, you know, this looks good. It was, it was backed up by data. It was all resourced within there. And I ended up joining, if you like, you know, the, the planning team, the technical services team within there. And uh, at, at that point, you know, digital and digital technologies, you know, were starting to come kind of thing, especially for planning, you know, project controls within there as well. So I started doing that. And uh, it, it was interesting. Around about you know, a couple of years into that, I, I think what was interesting as well, Steve, if you went back to then as a planning engineer, what we did have was huge amounts of data and it was in paper for outputs, productivity. I think it was George Wimpy had these big folders of all your outputs. You know, if it was a hundred mil block that you're putting up on a, you know, a good run of it, you knew that, you know, basically, you know, a, a bricky, you know, in a two to one squad would get something like two square meters an hour. You had a great amount of data within there, but it, it wasn't a digitized form. But you had you had bonus surveyors who are very good at actually capturing capturing data and be able to disseminate it uh, within there as well. And I remember thinking, oh, wouldn't that be great if we had all this in a database? And that was one of the things I used to try and do, you know, at you know, young age was trying to codify things. That was a big part, you know, I love building digital processes, uh, you think, because it made my life easier uh, within there. And I think it helped, uh, you know, within there. And then probably something else happened not long into there as well. This thing called Private Finance Initiative came out. And we were suddenly bidding, you know, projects that were in the hundreds of millions. And, you know, huge multidisciplinary teams on it, especially at that point as well, facilities and management teams. I think you're having been, you know, if you think back to a career you know, in terms of doing construction management, engineering, you know, you, you design things, you build it. You never really give thought to the operation side of thing. You think, you know, where we are now. And that was the first time I started to get involved with, if you like, you know, data from the operational, the 25, 30 years concession, what data did they need, you know, further downstream uh, within there as well. But probably the big thing that became, I always remember, is we suddenly had to collaborate more. We had to share lots of information at that point as well. And at that point, and this is something like the mid-1900, 1990X sort of thing uh, within there, we started to think about these things we now call common data environments, but you know, electronic ways of sharing information, not just within the organization, but then wider. You know, how did we come really good at doing that? So we started to see the first, if you like, you know, common data environments, you know, information management networks starting to appear as well. And I remember thinking, oh, this is good. This is going to take me back to the FAS lane days, because we're starting to become think about naming conventions. We're starting to think about processes for there. And it, and it was, I mean, it was like anything though, you know, folk using the excuse, you know, where's the information? What's in the common data environment? You know, we were there, but there was no real codification, you know, yeah. practice. Every job had its own name and conventions. Every job had its own way of doing it, uh, you know, within there as well. But probably at that point as well, I started, to, I took up a, a, a role as a technical services director. And that was about, you know, the front end, the project planning, work winning, and indeed, you know, the innovation side of things. You know, how did we get, you know, the, the leading edge uh, on, on things as well? 
And at that point, uh, when I was I was still at Balfour Beatty, I was actually at Balfour Beatty 20 years. Uh, I, I remember we went out to, we used to do a lot of military uh, housing. I went out to, I remember it was Washington DC, Charlotte, you know, a bit of a tour. I was there to look at this uh, company that we're potentially going to be buying. And uh, I, I remember meeting our counterparts out there. And everybody wanted to go out to the project site and, you know, see the concrete getting poured and, you know, how they're doing that. And I went to go and see the offices and see how they were bidding work and winning it. And they had this thing they were doing called building information modeling. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And I remember thinking, you know, I'd say to the guys, oh, 3D CAD. And they're like, no, 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 no. And uh, it, they showed me, you know, this world of parametric information, you know, not, not just starting to think about objects, objects of all sort of information within there. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And yeah, I'll be honest with you, I just thought it was better, you know, better quality of information for better geometry. You know, I did see it, you know, back then. And there's probably nothing wrong with that, you know, maybe back then. But I remember we went to one site and uh, they had, now in the US, they were combining two things. They had the process of building information modeling, but they also had this thing called virtual design construction. And that fascinating. I was lucky enough, I don't know if you can see it, I'll take it off the wall now, but you see a certificate at Stanford University. I've taken it off, Steve. I mean, I'm redecorating. Oh, okay. With, uh, okay. All right. Yep. But we went across, uh, you know, the cohort at uh, Stanford University done virtual design construction. We looked in terms of how do we become more collaborative? How do we build the processes in? Especially, you know, time simulation, cost simulation. Uh, within there and but the bit that got me really into it and this is where I saw the game changer was we went to a project site and it was a big uh one and Steve you're going to tell me you're too young to remember these but you remember you used to get projectors used to have the big red blue and green light in them yeah I remember yeah yeah absolutely. yeah 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 and they used to project them on the wall and they had this in a job site and they were doing a big concrete basement work and had a guy they were driving the model and uh, it, it was up and they were looking at the concrete port, it was a big retaining wall. And uh, there was a guy there, he had the braces and everything on, you know, sort of, you know, you know, the, the, you know, I don't know what age he was sort of thing, but uh, he, he was quite senior in the, their crew anyway. But he was somebody who was on the coal face, you know, he wasn't a supervisor, he wasn't a project manager. This is the person who's been doing the work, you know, had his gang there. And he's looking at the model on the screen and he's laughing and uh what you call it the guy's going what are you laughing at he goes i'm looking at the kicker detail in that he goes there's no way we can get shutter into it you know it's whatever i can't remember but the guy said okay okay and this is where it's actually the real if you like concurrent engineering you know in real time they had a coffee the guy said right what if we do this in real time i say real time probably got half an hour but he started to rework it and the guy saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, that's going to rework. That's better now. That will work. He's looking again, and he's screwing. And our guy goes, well, wait a minute. The density you've got for your, you know, your reinforcement, we'll never get the poker down it. Because we'll have to do this, do that. Again, another hour passed. And they didn't do it all, but, you know, I started to look at it. And there's about three, four things that went on. The guy goes, that's great. He goes, we went with port. And I was like, whoa. I said, what would happen if you had done this today? They went, well, you'd have tried to, you know, we'd tried to go the, you know, the shutter onto it. It wouldn't have worked. We'd have wasted a day waiting to redesign. We've tried to go and do something else within there, some alternative work face. But what do you call it? You know, it wouldn't have worked. You know, it wasted two weeks maybe in the program. Then we would, you know, done it. We tried to do the pour. It probably wouldn't have worked. We couldn't get the poker done. It probably have to break it out. But anyway, the whole thing was we'd have wasted six weeks, and I, I worked out. In terms of, if you like, variation orders and everything, you know, that was in the back of when folk used to carry the big sort of variation or workbooks in the back pocket. They would have lost somewhere like seven weeks on the critical path of the program. And, you know, they're about a quarter of a million dollars, you know, in terms of, you know, variations within there. And suddenly realized it was about virtual rehearsals. You know, you could actually rehearse things within there. But if anything, you could then sort of bring people around about the model. The model was becoming, if you like, the if you like the pivotal. It was almost like a campfire that folk could come round, and they could understand it within there as well. And I still think we kind of lost that a little bit in the UK. We're not bringing enough people, empowering them, round about the model. And 
I was lucky enough, thinking back with Alpha, we, we tried it as, I don't know if you ever heard the last planner for your production control. No. It, basically, it's, Steve, it's like a, a lean construction type there. It's about empowering those yep. that are actually doing the work. You're looking at weekly work planning, looking there. And we started to use BIM, but we also used it with this collaborative, you know, because it was about cultural change as much as anything within there. And that was getting real sort of improving productivity. It was empowering people. People were getting better bonuses because, you know, the, the work they could do, they knew that there was no constraints that had been checked, uh, with, you know, with as well. So BIM is building information. Modeling started to be in the UK, a big part of my career and day job. And then, but I was still interested in other things as well. I was interested in you know property construction management still, so I went back and done my masters again at night, and I loved doing that because that gave me a different skill set. You know, I went back from doing the HND side of things to to there. So lifelong learning has been a huge, huge part. I think what you do, you know, I still love learning things every day uh, within there. And then 2010, I think it was, I got a second in the cabinet office. Then with the it was a government construction strategy 2011. 2016 uh, and i remember going to the interview for it no one asked me about bim yeah. everything was about change you know how would you manage a change program how would you manage cultural change and talking about information and data uh, with there but there's nothing about building information modeling i was lucky enough to get it and i, I remember you know saying after it you know well, what, why did why did i get it sort of thing you didn't ask me any bim questions I said well no it's a change program you know it's about people it's about culture it's as much about procurement as anything within there and i was lucky enough to be part of that change movement for about five years with their working with the bim task group and you know that's when we started to set up all the bim four groups and you know now in terms of you know obviously you got you know all in terms of you know the uk bim alliance and all the groups that that you know have continued on with that legacy doing great work but it, it was such an exciting time within there as well and and you look back, you think, why was it why was it so successful uh, at that point in time? I think there's an elegant simplicity what to as well, wasn't there? It was as simple as BIM level two by twenty sixteen. Started to think, and it was and it, it was interesting because everybody talks about you know BIM now and we need to move to information management. We actually, if you ever look back to the original sort of you know the the business case and everything for it we always refer to it as building information modeling and management you know within the, the the work of the government it was always information modeling and management within there you think actually you know we, we probably came uh full circle but if you look back to then as well i think it was never about just technology change it was never about if you like the you know just trying to put technology in we were building processes for information management and you think if you look at the elegance the elegance of it it was being able to answer questions using data and information there and building collaborative practices up uh in terms of what that was going to look like especially to support you know procurement data stream operation and if you looked at projects back then often taking what a year from project completion the point of handover to get all that information into all the asset management systems are from there so for a year you know, assets can perform as they should with there. It was a very manual intensive process in terms of what, it, you know, what it was doing. You know, there was not a lot of collaboration uh, going on. But I think the great thing around about the government construction strategy, there was lots of themes. BIM was just one of them. We also had project bank accounts. And the bit for me that, that I love, and I still think, you know, it, it, it's, it's the bit, the precursor to BIM is government soft landings. Think about the outcomes. Can you, can you just, sorry, Dave, to interrupt you, could you just explain what that is? So assuming someone would be new to soft landings, just br briefly briefly what that is, because I think that's really important for sort of your new role now, measuring impact and measurement. Can you, can you just explain that for someone who's never heard of it potentially? Y yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, so it, it, was, it was always about probably, number one, I think government soft landings is a timely reminder that what we design and construct has got real value you know, in terms of it achieves outcome, it might be societal outcomes, it might be, you know, a hospital that you're willing to get better healthcare outcomes, a school that's going to, if I like, obtain better, you know, inclusion, examples for the people having better with it. But 
our built assets, you know, create value within there, but we often forget that. So it was much about trying to make sure that we put a big focus on the outcomes at the very beginning. Now, to do that, it meant that we had to bridge the chasm between those who design construct and those who operate within there. So at the most simple level, it was about bringing these teams together there we start, often in terms of a business case for a project. So very clear operational outcome objectives within there. You know, you know, is it going to perform as it should? And that's not just in the case of, you know, from energy or, you know, building services there. It's also maybe thinking about back to hospital is it you know a good environment for say you know healthcare professionals the facilities management teams what information do they need and a lot of that was just you know it was about people it was about bringing people together but from a digital and an information management point of view it was about making sure that we were going to start to reality test to make sure as we were designing constructing that it could meet its operational outcomes that was trying to do so you know could it actually achieve uh, you know as i said i'll give you a really basic uh one within there you know it was number one in the process was you know learn lessons from previous projects and i remember one of the first ones the state team said hey we've done something somewhere there was no hard clash between the boiler plant but it was very hard for us to get in and maintain right about it you know when we're doing our inspections you know changing filters and we put that in a plain language question you know, as the design was evolving, uh, was, you know, is there sufficient space for, you know, FM teams to be able to, you know, it wasn't a, a clash, but to sufficiently be able to maintain boiler plant. And I remember the reality check, the workshop, there was, you know, the, the lovely model came up, but it showed that, you know, they had an avatar that showed that, you know, there was enough space for somebody to be able to get safely in between them, but also to be able to remove the plant as well within there. We were seeing, you know, testing people flow in hospitals, you know, within there. Is it has it got good wayfinding uh, within there as well? But it was also starting to be a big emphasis on a system of record, which we now refer to as the golden thread. And we referred back to way back then, the soft language is creating a golden thread of information, but also purpose. And I think we've kind of lost that now when we think about the golden thread. You know, it, it's about a system of record. But it was also sure when we've done government soft landings, it was going to maintain the purpose of what it set out for. Those operational objectives in the business case were attained. And we do that through post-occupancy evaluation. It was been extended, you know, after care period as well. It was testing it, you know, within there. You know, is it doing it? It was maybe user satisfaction surveys. But we were using digital and information to think about virtual rehearsals but also to create an accurate digital system of record for the asset to make sure that it can be maintained safely. And again, avoiding the tragedies such as Grenfell, you know, Oxgang Primary School within there as well. So to me, that convergence between building information modeling as an information management process and soft landings, you know, focus on operational outcomes, you know, hugely important. And if you do look at the UK BIM framework, it's still a key part of it. Uh, for those that are a big fan of uh, references, it's BS8536. And please, you know, have a look. There's a lot of good stuff out there on, on government soft landings. Great. Th thanks, Dave. And and I, I, I guess if, if I could just ask you a question, if I can, just on your current role with regard to impact. So I think... With other people I've spoken with, you know, some are data digital professionals, some are not. I mean, obviously, that's a core part of um, what you do. And, you know, you've been working with the government as well. So you're lit literally leading these things. So um, one of the things I always talk about is sort of benefits, outcomes, consequences. And you've got the word impact. So I guess, I guess the question is, how, how do we measure impact? I mean, I'll, I'll ask it as loosely as that, because... I get asked quite a lot and there's so many ways to do it but what's your perspective on how do we measure impact of data digital uh, how, how, do, how do you go about it what, what, where do we start yeah so it's a good point steve so I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been seconded into the construction innovation hub and i'm one of the impact directors uh you know as part of the program but what does that mean it means we're working with many clients especially government departments to make sure that the work we're doing especially on the themes of information management, value, quality, uh, and if you like the advanced manufacturer, all realize impact uh, within there as well. 
And, and one of the things we do is we use like a, a science of change, if you like. So we use a framework around about it uh, to do. It. So, so, so number one is we need to start off with understanding the client. You know, we understand them. We've got to look in terms of you know that benchmarking, you know, their their current outcomes, their KPIs within there as well. So be able to understand the reference benchmark data, I think it's hugely important. But we work, if you like, uh, you know, with the clients to look at not just the outcome, but the wider benefits, the impact they can make. Now, that might be transcend that project. And I think one of the big things is we're seeing lots of clients now thinking, if you like, about impact in the context of a systems of systems. You know, what happens if you, you know, put a, let's say a new a school there? Well, What's, how could that impact upon you improving, if you like, you know, let, let's say transportation networks, how's it going to improve social benefits within there as well? One of the things we do at a real practical level, Steve, to actually look at it, and I think it's hugely important to do, is I mentioned value. We use our value toolkit right at the beginning to look at it, to build a profile which is tied, if you like, to, you know, the impact pathway we got. But we work it then back, you know, we start with the, the impact, well, what outcomes do we need to do that? What are the activities we need to do to enable it? It might be building indeed new standards within there. It might be pilot projects uh, within there as well, but look at all the enablers. So we work, if you like, reverse engineer it back, but we use the value toolkit to help us, if you like, create the value profile of the impact that we want to do. So right at the beginning of the project, looking at the value and then using data to actually test it right the way through but starting very much with clear purpose in terms of what it looks like. And I think increasingly, especially if you look at lots of the government, you know, initiatives that are going on, TIP 2030, uh, the sorry, TIP, I shouldn't use acronyms, the Transforming Infrastructure Performance Roadmap 2030. You look in terms of that, it's very government policies that are very impact driven. You look at the top of it, you know, there's some great, visualizations so for those that haven't I, I, you can download this free of charge it's uh it's essentially the cabinet office or infrastructure project authorities uh policy guide for the next 10 years and when you do look at it you see there's a great model for the built environment that suggests everything we do you know should start with outcomes and they use the united nations sustainability development goals as a mouthful uh for this time in the morning but that's some of their key impacts are trying to achieve and they show through that how a systems of systems through value, data is going to hit coming up from the bottom is going to support the decisions that are then going to drive value in terms of what we're doing. And I think that's hugely important as well. Uh, th thanks, Dave. You, you mentioned the UN SDG Sustainable Development Goals. I um, I think it's really it's great that they're in there. I, I think just an observation, slightly changing the topic. Do you see them, the SDGs, I know we talk about something wider, but just out of interest, uh, used in organisations uh, a lot? Because we see them at a government level. I'm doing some work with the World Banks, so of course, we talk about them there for obvious reasons, but I don't I don't see them enough places. Uh, just, just as an anecdote, I'll see occasionally people with a pin badge with some nice colours on it, and I think, SDGs, and we high-five each other, and then we walk off. But do you have you seen them like out in the wild i, I you know yeah, so, it's a missed opportunity maybe for but what do you think yeah and i think this is i'm really interested in actually uh right i'd, I'd refer this back to to, to 1969 yep yeah? i hate that i wasn't born then but i've read the books on it that uh kennedy said we want to put someone on the moon yep their moonshot was put someone on the moon before the century's out yep and if you, I think you went back to the early 60s, wow, you know, the technology wasn't there yet to do it with there, but they had outcomes. The outcome was to put within there, and they put an amazing program to do it. But the thing they were very good at, and this is something I spent a lot of time looking at, was what we refer to as line of sight. That remember when, well, reportedly when Kenny went into to NASA, he saw someone, the janitor, you know, cleaning the floors and said, hey, you know what you're doing? He said, I'm put, help put someone put on the moon. Everybody knew their, their mission. Everybody was part of that big idea. Now, I think that's what we've got to do as well. Our moonshot is to try and achieve these UN sustainability goals, low carbon, whatever they are and what the relevance is. And everybody, in terms of no matter what your role is, has got to be seen. But here, I think it's the problem, Steve. I think there's too big a gap between these macro targets and what everybody does, maybe in a project site. Now, 
This is the work that Centre for Digital Built Britain done that I think really, really helps. It was trying to put, I think it is a translation layer in between it, yeah. and it was called functional requirements. What are the functional requirements? So, there, so it's actually trying to translate it down and saying, so you can imagine, you can then take one of the tiles and say, let, let's say something relates to low carbon. You know, what are the success factors then if we're going to achieve that? Well, actually, maybe we need to be able to, you know, have carbon dictionaries. We need to be able to both embedded, you know, embedded carbon, operate carbon there. But it's starting to build, if you like, a series, if you like, of functional or critical success factors to translate between the UN SDG goals as an impact back to what does it mean if we're being able to get a line of sight between no matter what your role is, you know, how you're playing your role within there as well. So I think that the communication of the big ID needs to come down to real practical steps within there as well. So if they actually realise it, because everybody knows it's the right thing to do, but I don't think they yet know what their role is in doing it. And I think trying to create, you know, the, this line of sight approach to me becomes a really important, you know, part of it. Yes. Is that how people fit in? And you're using the word line of sight, and I, I, I have seen the document that you're uh, that, that that came out as well mm. as you can imagine. So again, I'll add a I'll add a link to that. And line of sight, when you say it, reminds me, or or is exactly overlapped with um, things like ISO fifty five thousand. Again, I don't want to go too much into the standards nor the jargon because me me talking about that standard probably won't help the conversation, but. Again, for, for people watching, that's a strategic, mature standard for asset, strategic asset management. And again, uh, power, the predecessors to that, Powers 55, we used to talk about line of sight. We talk about alignment now only because the word internationalized better. But anyway, conceptually, exactly the same. What you do up here uh -huh. how, or, or down here, how does it relate to up here? I'm with you. I mean, and data and digital data is that thread. And I... Yeah, it's a match made in heaven, or it should be. I, I think yeah, I'm with you, hundred percent. It's a, it's trying to create this kit as you come through the. As you're right to say, you know, you come through the onion seed. In fact, if you went to ISO fifty five thousand, you've got the outer level of that to say is, you know, what are your, you know, your organisational objectives and how does your asset management strategy. But then I think what we're seeing now is there's another layer, isn't there, that goes beyond the organisations. It's now this is a bit really fascinates me. I could really geek out in this. Have you ever read Donut please Economics? Do. Donut Economics? No, I'm I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Pl please do gonna, geek out and educate bit. me. No. Right. It's a bit that'll change your life. Yep. Okay. Donut economics. Now okay. what you can yep. see the donut there, and for folk that aren't uh, are watching this audio, I'm I'm trying to conceptualize a donut. And the outer layer of the donut is basically, you know, if you're doing anything that is either inside the hole or outside it is bad, it's not giving enough value. But then, because outside that, it's creating damage to society. You're overproducing. So, thinking about your project, what we're doing should fit within the Goldilocks zone. Within there, it's giving value, but it's not overproducing. That it's going to actually go through the, if you like, you know, the climate barrier. That's going to actually do bad to society within there as well. So, I think people are now thinking about not just the project, but they're also thinking or the organisation, but they're also now thinking about what is the societal benefits or damages that we can do as well through. Our investments from there. So that's back to, to what you said as well, Steve. This is where we're starting to see investors getting interested into it because, you know, from an ESG point of view, they'd want to invest things that are going to be doing bad to the societal point of view. So donut economics is it's similar ways to think like a 21st century economist, but we need to think about these things, I think, in terms of our built environment. I um I think that's come up on almost everyone I spoke with in either indirectly or directly, and I think that that has to be the the hook for a lot of people with businesses. It's it's always what what's the hook, and that that and that's what one of the I say newer, but one of the more talked about ones now. I think that's a great way in because it's. I, can I just pick you up as well? I, I assume the answer would be yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but triple bottom line is another one that comes up as well. Is that? Is that something? Can, is that something you talk about? Again, this is for people that probably aren't familiar with that. But um, even people I talk to that should know better sometimes in a professional context. So, oh yeah, this asset or system has a va monet value, monetary value, and I'll say, yeah, yeah, but it has different dimensions of value. Could could I know we're touching on it? Could you just elaborate around triple bottom line and what we mean by that? Yeah, I think my thinking's changed away from this triple bottom line concept, I must admit. And I see it now around about four, the four capital model. 
And I think for what we think about, you know, we've got one of the bits that's been missing, I think, is natural capital. You know, what, what is the impact to, you know, the, you know, the natural, we've got produced capital there, we've got human capital and such like around about it. But I like to think of it as, you know, the, you know, the impact in, in terms of these four capitals. And the Israeli say money being one of them. But I now think we're also moving away from capital cost, I hope, to think more about the whole life cost of an asset uh, within there as well, which we, we need to think more and more. So big need to change procurement, I think, within there as well. But to me, that if we are a change in procurement, uh, I, I think what I got, I was really interested in, and I've done a, a bit of work was, Remember during you know our our health in terms of COVID, you know round about the UK we spun up amazingly quick hospitals you know within there up in Scotland we had you know Louisiana Jordan and Glasgow, and mm-hmm. I, I remember going to see you know our client NHS Scotland you know contract when the contract was bound for BT and you think wow you know look at the size of something we've done in a matter of you know weeks, and the, the bit I mean the construction part of it was amazing. However, the bit that, that really blew my socks off were, think about if you're, you know, doing a hospital, it can take you several years to do a business case. It can take you a year, two years to procure it. These were done in days and hours because we've done it digitally. We've done it collaboratively. And I think there's so many projects get stalled within there because, and I think the, the, when we're doing, you know, the Respond. Everybody was saw what impact we're trying to do. Everybody was pulling the same direction. It became much more. I wouldn't even say collaborative. It became much more integrated, and digital technologies were a key enabler of that. But, and I think that's the big thing. It's not just if they say, oh, you know, we can, we can use technology to reduce the construction time. No, let, let's think more about how we reduce not just construction, but actually how do we think about reducing if you like, the the procurement period, the business case period, rather than always trying to squash the construction piece within there, we've got to think about this much more holistically in terms of that overall time frame, uh, you know, within there as well. So for me, things like, you know, the triple bottom line important, but I think now using, if I get, you know, the the four capitals round about it, I think being, you know, putting the lens over the ones that are important to you. I think a different perspective, and I I think it's it's, it's very helpful that, that, you, you've said, oh, well, I'd, I'd have it in a different way, in a different proposition, because I think a persistent theme through chatting with everyone on, on these podcasts is around communication. And again, you know, good communication. Again, that was one of the first things you talked about was how you how you t- got into, into this sector was around change management. Well, that's obviously the big deal there is people, how we communicate with people, messaging the, the the why the purpose and i think um i know i said this in one of the conferences when you were talking as a as a sort of almost rhetorical question it's quite interesting when we talk about digital transformation or however we're talking about a lot of the, what we are however we call it is what i mean a lot of the elements are not digital transformation itself it, it's it's things like change you know change well you could say they are part of it but what i mean is they're mature sectors in their own right that's what i mean change management is a mature sector in its own right business process management business process optimization i have friends that's all they do they don't do digital they do business process things like taxonomy so that's classification that people aren't information taxonomy i have uh, friends of mine that only do that not in our sector and messaging and comms so i'm really fascinated maybe this is rhetorical and it should be a question but could we do more as a sector to get other people involved not from this sector from digital so we want to do business process optimization well there are business process optimization professionals are we talking to them i guess discuss i'll throw it out there but my observation is maybe there could be more outreach to other sectors i don't know if you've got a take on that yeah 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 definitely i do actually but but it's like two different ones i think we're, we're missing t- two things number one is number one is the automatic is we want to go and speak to folk in the car and say for some obscure reason uh within there and i think when we measure productivity against you know an oem type space i think it's kind of skewed with there but i'll come back to that in a minute so number one is i think we need inwards we need to you look one of the biggest challenges you know esg obviously being a massive one but we've still never cracked productivity now, how many folk actually go and speak to the workforce that are actually digging the trenches for utilities within there? They're actually speaking to the folk that are, are actually on the tools. We, we, we kind of forget. We, we always get into management consultants within there. 
And I, I remember back at Valfer BT, that we were trying to solve this very you know, massive client problem. You know, for it was to do with I can't remember. It was how we connected. You know, the new pipes from you know the sort of disconnect into the and we had a bit of an innovation center at Derby, and we took I think it was four folk who were on the tools that done this day out and there and said, right, you know, let's put you with some sort of you know innovation type folk. They solved it. You know, it, it wasn't the the boffins, right? But, but it was actually giving folk out their time out their day job to say, hey, is there a better way of doing this? So so number one is let's empower people that are actually doing these things in a day-to-day job. We're great coming up with great ideas and thinking, but actually it's still, you know, and you go to a site, you know, folk are still walking about, you know, my daughter's doing, she's 16, her modern day civil engineering apprentice, so she's out with a few other, you know, I can ask her, is that, is that going to improve what you do? So we need to, I think, empower those on the coal face. And at the same time, you rightly say, those in adjacent industries. And I sometimes, I hate to say it, I sometimes think, you know, folks, we use the, the McKinsey, you know, here's, you know, manufacturing productivity, here's construction. I'm not going to, but I think we're, you know, often, we're not comparing apples and apples from there. But the folk that, I, that I've went out and spoke to that I think can blow my head away are often in the retail sector space. You know, you think how many, you know, you know we're quite compared, we do logistics, don't we? You think how many objects we bring to a site and how many things that are moving about within there. It, it, it's often been, you know, the, the, the sectors that are quite surprising at times within there. It's not automotive, it, it's not, you know, the aviation sectors within there, but sometimes things like retail. I also don't think we speak to academia enough. Some of the researchers and developers, especially early stage, you know, are brilliant as well within there. I think there's we've got a great community. But for, for me, let's, number one, let's start with those on the coal face and ask them. You know, yeah. can we do any bit? We've got technologies there. Is there any way we can help support you? Is there any data sets that can help you with in there sort of thing? So I'm quite passionate about empowering those at the coal face yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. Touche. Where, where I saw it um, done quite well was uh, when I worked at Tube Lines, which was again was a PPP for the London Underground. And and again, we they had six, you know, six sigma and whatever people think about that. It, in that program did empower people. And again, there was innovation, but it was about incentivizing. I guess, I guess um, just staying with the theme, but asking you straight up, how do we incentivize people? Because I think it's always about how do you empower people? I agree, but it's also about incentivizing change. Now, if you work, I'll be careful what I say here, but if you work in, let's just nebulously say in certain sectors, I'll just say that there isn't any imperative to to change. So the the example at the very beginning, you mentioned PFI. Well, there's probably no surprise there were contracts and there was you know you had to do things and i mentioned how i got into this which probably was because tube lines was a ppp right whether people pol- politically agree or not uh, we had to be clear about what we were doing so i guess just throwing it out there how do we incentivize change we may have covered it you might not have anything to add but that's how do we stimulate change in sectors that aren't used to this uh, um change how do, how do we make people want to change yeah, no, no, number one, I think, is we, we need to reform procurement, I think. Yeah, I think and the ones that I've seen that, again, folk have wanted to change more is IPD integrated project, delivery projects. It's an integrated team that there's a pain gain mechanism on. So, you know, if, if you can innovate, then actually it's in your and the wider team's benefit, you know, within there. If you fail at something, well, everybody shares the pain sort of thing with there, but everybody tries to, to solve the problem, not one individual within there. So I think if we can think more about more integrated, I think IPDO, integrated project delivery and operate. But I think if we can think about, you know, procurement models that incentivize outcomes and impact, and also start to think more and more about, if you like, servitization forms of contract as well, that you get paid for you're actually delivering. You know, we talk about other industries, you know, power by the hour, you know, should we be a bit like PFI sort of thing again, but, I think something that's more outcome-led procurement, but more integrated project delivery that there's incentivization to innovate and actually everybody pulling in the same direction from a, a cultural point of view. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really good, thanks. And and, and again, w- I think we, we, we see it, don't we, f- firsthand sort of in some sectors or domains, it's f- very good at, at making change happen, others not so. Um, I, th- I think uh, because we don't have much time, though, what I, I'd normally ask, where should people find more information? I think you've already mentioned lots of um, resources out there like uh, TIP 2030, which I'll link to. 
so but is, is there anything else you've so for people maybe quite new to this topic where they could find more information that we maybe haven't touched on are there any websites or, or industry yeah, bodies that you work with one if you're interested from the information side of things if you like uk bill lines so uk bim framework has got an amazing free to use guides within there the construction innovation hub website has again is going to take you into wider than just information management it's going to take you into advanced manufacture through platforms value toolkits and the center for digital built britain has lots of again of, of great free resources uh you know within there as well uh you know i think which are which are you know all, all fantastic free resources uh with there but, but again i think it's like anything isn't it yeah just finding 10 minutes at night to just to try and look at something that's a bit new that's going to excite you within there as well sort of thing so it, it's something that i try and do every day just take 10 minutes to to learn something outside what i do in the day job i mean it's that book and donut economics you know if i thought you know 30 years ago i'd be reading a book and, and actually thinking wow that's really to what we do so we think about diversity it's about you know training ourselves to look at things that are outside our, our every day as well isn't it Yes, and I, I, I think I completely agree with you. I'm always quite curious. Um, obviously, you're talking about a, a book there, but looking, going to sector events that aren't my sector, because it, yeah, it what depends. I... What, what if we see what we do as a horizontal or vertical? I get confused, but I see it as a horizontal, did, 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 you know, digital transformation. But often I'll go to, you know, to, my background isn't in water and all the rest of it. So I, I think that, that that's what people don't do. They're not out of their comfort zone enough, and. Um, are there any event again? Sorry to put you on the spot again, but are there any uh, events off the or just off the top of your head that people might want to go to physical events um, that you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think one of the main ones, and again, I, I'm sure I'm, I think the right saying it's free is Digital Construction Week is always a uh, yes. you know a good one because I think it is so diverse as you know, Steve. It's it, especially out of the world of geomatics within there as well, you know, measure survey. Uh, but it's very diverse. There's lots in terms of you know data capture, you know, in terms of using uav technology uh you know and and other sort of things within there so when i always go through that it, i find it really relevant because i can touch things and think oh that's what it, how it will work sort of thing i also like the traditional ones as well i like going to uk construction week because i can see i can understand and understand some of the real world problems that folk have got within there i was at the the one that was really enjoyed last week was down at coventry you know that if like the off-site one within there as well so mm. And I think the more and more, as you so mentioned, that we don't just go to digital ones, and all you do is speak to the same people that you meet every week, sort of thing. And uh, it's okay, we can chat, dude. With uh, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I, I, so, so, just literally finish up, and and very briefly, uh, if uh, I'm sure there's loads of things, but what, what, what do you, th what do you think is the sort of the one, ch one single biggest challenge that we need to overcome to make the biggest sort of change now how, how do we move the digital forward and digital enablement forward what's what one the one big topic that we we could make more of a a dent in or, or we need to focus on i'm sure there's a hundred but is there one off the top of your head yeah yeah for, for me it's still about bringing people together it's still about physically bringing people i mentioned virtual design construct when i go out to places like hong kong singapore the us i think they're very good at bringing physically people together around about technology Whereas we, I think we are too guilty of saying, hey, it's on the common data environment. You can sit in front in your computer there and not think about bringing teams. So for me, it's about people. It's about using technology to, to bring people together, you know, either physically a bit in a, or a virtual world, you know, world as well yeah. uh, within their sort of thing. So it's people that make change happen, isn't it? And I think the more we can do to, uh, you know, within there, of course, the metaverse might be where we'll meet in 10 years time. Metaverse. Well, I'll see you there. Yeah, I need to get some glasses first. But okay, I've I've taken your your time. So and I could talk all day. So um, again, the the so thank you very much for your time, uh, David Philp, for for uh, giving your insight. And and again, just to obviously summarise that within an hour or less, we can only way way find people. Is there anywhere specific if people want to contact you? Is there anywhere online uh they they can go? Uh LinkedIn or, yeah, or the, a the, website? the best one and, and I will uh unless you've got anything to sell me which will probably just ignore but uh it, it is through LinkedIn. If you just type in David Philp and you'll see a picture of me that's probably about 15 years out of date uh within there as well. Also avoid my dad is also David Philp and um, my dad sort of happily happily sort of answers 
uh, sort of questions, but base guess it around to football pretty quickly, sort of thing. So just make sure it's uh, it's the right, David Phil. Yeah. But definitely LinkedIn, and I I look forward to you know speaking to everyone. Great, thank you, thank thanks, David. Th- thanks so much for your time. So we'll close it there. Thank you. Cheers.